sponsored by the Samuel Bud Shorsting Endowment in American Jewish Culture. Uh, that generosity, as you know, has made possible many events already this year. Um, and the Shorsting Endowment has also made possible three undergraduate writing prizes with $500 and $1,000 awards. This year, the due date for the writing awards is in March, the beginning of March. So if you look on our Jewish Studies website, you will find information about the three categories for submission. So that should give you time to polish up an essay or research paper that you might be doing uh, for a class this semester. You do not have to be a Jewish studies major or minor to submit. Uh, you just need to be working on a project that has Jewish content. Um, and if you go on our website, you'll see information about our past winners. They've come from um, all majors, uh, a real range of majors at the university. Uh, today's event, which is a panel discussion that we hope will soon include your um, comments and questions at the end of the event, is about a new book titled Jewish Women in Comics, Bodies, and Borders. Um, and we have a few of the book's contributors with us today. Uh, so first off is Margaret Galvin, who is an assistant professor of visual rhetoric in the Department of English here at UF. Uh, in her research, she, ex she examines how visual culture operates within the print media of feminist and queer social movements of the 1970s and 80s. Um, her first book, Invisible Archives, Queer and Feminist Visual Culture in the 1980s, is forthcoming in th this coming fall um, from the University of Minnesota Press's Manifold Scholarship Series. Uh, also with us is Professor Megan Fowler, who is an instructor at the University of, University of Alabama and also an alumna of UF's English department. Uh, her research interests include children's literature, gender and queer studies, critical race theory, comic studies, and film media studies. Her current research project focuses on queer representation and trauma in contemporary media um, and young adult literature and web comics. And then we also have um, um, Tanir Oxman, who is Associate Professor of Academic Writing at Marymount Manhattan College in New York City in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Language, where she teaches classes in writing, literature, comics, and journalism. She is the author of How Come Boys Get to Keep Their Noses, Women and Jewish Identity in Contemporary Graphics Memoirs, and the co-editor of, of, of another um, book about comics for which she won a 2020 Comics Study society prize um so i think we're gonna start off with uh professor galvin then oh hello it's so nice to see you all um so lovely being conversation um so for my opening remarks i'm going to introduce you to sharon rudall um, I chose a really lovely cover for you to look at for a brief moment. Um, and so for the forthcoming volume on Jewish Women in Comics, uh, I contributed a short essay that accompanied the reprinting of one of her comics. So the volume is really cool because it's not just essays. It's also, um, I think, Tanir, your piece too is also similar in that it's like some, it's a lot of comics. And so they got a lot of, um, a lot of rare comics that are hard to find. Um, so uh, next slide. Yeah, so Rudolph is an American cartoonist who began her career in the San Francisco underground comic scene in the early 70s. She's well known for her work across the long running women's comic series, which ran from 72 to 92, including her editing of Women's Comics Number no. 3 in 1973. You can see the back cover is her artwork um, there. She also contributed to many other underground series um, and following her growing success, um, she completed a solo science fictional comic, Adventures of Crystal Knight, in 1980, which you can see on the next slide. Um, in recent years, she also um, created a graphic biography of Emma Goldman. And across her work, you can say that she explores uh, Jewish female and activist identities, often combining these subject positions in comics that read as historic, science fictional, or overtly political. She meditates jointly on these three identities in her, her historic comic, Debubby as well as in other comics like Adventures of Crystal Knight. So next slide. Yeah. So in four pages, just four short pages, um, uh, this comic recounts uh, the early life of her grandmother, Eva, 
and the anti-Semitic circumstances that caused her and her family to leave Ukraine and immigrate to America in 1905. The depiction of a violent pogrom, which you can see in the very first panel, dominates the horizontal and vertical space of the page and frames the entire comic. Rudolph's accompanying textual narration explains how these pogroms combined with anti-Semitic laws that prohibit Jewish land ownership constrain the lives of the Jews. We are introduced to Eva in the ghetto where she grows up as a daughter of the rabbi who leads their community. We see a daily life often untouched by the state violence, but anti-Semitic actions dramatically redirect the course of Eva's life. First, her love interest, Alexei, the neighboring ghetto is arrested for his radical pamphleteering, and then a more explicit return of pogrom violence destroys her husband's business and threatens their lives. So let's go to the next slide so you can see the last two pages. Um, these actions not only endanger Eva physically, but they also force her out of previously stable communities and into new uncharted territory. In the first is instance, her family arranges a marriage that displaces her from the ghetto near Kiev to a new life as a merchant's wife in Odessa. Following that second trauma, Eva convinces her distraught husband that they need to leave Ukraine for the sake of their son, um, and she is the one who leads the procession across Europe to Normandy, where they depart by boat to the US. Implicit in this recounting is that it's not simply Eva's Jewishness, but it's also her identity as a woman that results in these border crossings. Even prior to these anti-Semitic displacements, her desire for liter literacy, prohibited by her rabbi father, leads her to travel to the neighboring ghetto where the more progressive rabbi educates her alongside her son, Alexei, who becomes her love interest. While her community hides her following um, his arrest and um, positions her arranged marriages all for the best, uh, these actions also censure her for striving to be a different kind of woman. Though men and women in her community both participate in enforcing traditional gender roles as her father refuses to teach her how to read, and he also thanks God he was not born a woman in a prayer at the very beginning of the comic, um, and the women in the community um, comment on her inappropriate behavior and send her away to Odessa. In Odessa, her vulnerability becomes strength as she remains determined to survive in the face of anti-Semitic violence while her merchant husband is overwhelmed by the situation. In short, Rudolph shows how Eva's experiences as a woman make her more flexible in navigating hardship and the loss of class status. Um, next slide. Though this comic illustrates the story of her grandmother, Rudolph also claims the story as her own in text and image. In prefatory text above the comic's title, she asserts, this is a story of my life in a previous incarnation, the story of my grandmother, Eva. She again lays claims to this lineage in the last panel of the comic, where the final words denote America as a place where, quote, her children, Abraham, Nancy, and my mother, Ruth, were born. She also draws her grandmother in her own likeness, as you can see on this slide. In casting the story as hers in these different ways, Rudolph enacts a post-memorial relationship to her her heritage that Tanir Oxman's scholarship on Jewish American women's comics is particularly deft at unpacking. Extending Mariana Hirsch's concept of post-memory and analysis throughout her book, and I always love to say the title, How Come Boys Get to Keep Their Noses, Oxman observes, revisiting and revising the past and the present as a way for Jewish women to create spaces in which to dwell. That dwelling is also something that Rudolph extends into the future in her science fiction comics, like Adventures of Crystal Knight, whose titular character also looks quite like her, as you can also see on this slide. Um, and so, next slide, yeah. At the outset of Crystal Knight, we are introduced to Vera, who's on a visit to Grandma Strauss, who spends time reminding her of family history and how they lived through Crystal Knocked and later escaped the country and survived the Holocaust. As you can see, this whole page is that first um, uh, instance of their visit. Vera listens intently and promises her grandmother that she will remember. As her power-hungry parents have her grandmother sent away, presumably to her death, as they gain full control of the company. This one-page co comic printed on the inside of Crystal Knight frames a story. Very quick, lots of things happening here. Um, references to Jewish history return. Um, so next slide. As an adult, Vera takes in a child born naturally among the impoverished and assumed a genetically inferior class of people, virtually unheard of in a world of genetic selection and cloning, and she names her Crystal Knight. Because Crystal's raised out of an oppressed class of people with ident this identity hidden from those around her, and she also becomes interested in saving this community when she learns of her heritage, she, she sort of functions as an Esther figure um, in the story. However, she finds herself having to act ruthlessly 
even reporting her own stepsister for seditious activities in order to attain a position of power where she can save her people. After she succeeds in passing legislation that will allow them to emigrate off planet for the, better, the chance at a better life, she discovers that her program is being used to work these volunteers to death in off-world labor camps. There is a moment of deus ex machina that succeeds in transforming her into a positive legend for future generations um, when she topples the corrupt system with the help of an alien invader. But neither she nor the woman Vera who raised her are able to stop the genocidal terror around them and are somewhat complicit in a system that enacts this horror. Through the genre of science fiction, Rudolph examines the persistence not only of generational trauma, but also of systemic dis discrimination, delving into the pain buried in Jewish women's lives, whereas in her non-science fictional work, she primarily tends to uplift and celebrate these parts of herself. So that's, uh, next slide, that's it. Thanks so much, I look forward to the discussion. Hi, um, I'm Megan Fowler, um, and my presentation will be about, again, two of the major sort of figures in the mainstream DC Comics universe, Kate Kane and Harley Quinn, specifically talking about them as two Jewish queer women and the representation therein in mainstream comics of that identity. So. He was just a Jew, so am I, the queer Jewish identity of DC Comics Batwoman and Harley Quinn. Kate Kane, alias Batwoman, and Harleen Quinzel, alias Harley Quinn, are two of the most prominent and iconic queer Jewish women in the pantheon of DC Comics heroes and villains. A number of components accompany most depictions of Harley's and Kate's Jewishness in the comics. First, these moments usually occur in a holiday special set during Hanukkah, or again in a mainstream context, Christian context in America, Christmas time. The comics first indicate Kate's Jewishness in Comic 52, number 33, the most wonderful time of the year, when she celebrates Hanukkah with her girlfriend Renee Montoya. The DC Infinite Holiday Special, similarly, in a short comic called Lights, follows Kate's relationship with an older woman named Manya, the only member of her family to have survived the Holocaust, who she visits during Hanukkah. While Lights deals explicitly with Kate's Jewishness and kinship with other Jewish women centrally, the narrative still restricts this representation to Hanukkah as a holiday period. The lack of representation of Kate's identity outside the celebration of one of the Jewish holidays most well known among Gentiles gives readers very little sense of her everyday lived experience as a Jewish woman. And we see this pretty consistently um, through Kate's representation in mainstream comics. In addition to often being limited to depiction during the holiday season, Harley demonstrates ambivalence about her Jewishness consistently throughout most depictions. In Gotham City Sirens number seven, Holiday Story, Harley visits her mother's home in Benhurst, Brooklyn, um, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, for the holidays, giving readers one of the few glimpses of Harley with her biological family. Throughout the comic, the Jewish home is presented as dysfunctional, suffocating, and restricting, an environment in which Harley is unremittingly crit excuse me, critiqued and unappreciated. Harley elects not to stay for the holiday, instead returning to the home she shares with Ivy and fellow supervillain Catwoman. When Ca Catwoman asks her how her visit home went, Harley responds, it was terrible, horrible beyond all human comprehension. It just proved to me one thing, there's no place like home. Comics like Holiday Story suggest that Harley must reject her connections to her ethnicity in favor of her kinship with queer Gentile women such as Selena and Poison Ivy, her love interest. Um, in another similar comic, um, DC Rebirth Harley Quinn number 10, Egg Noggin, the depiction of Harley's relationship to her Jewishness continues to be contentious. The comic opens with Harley on her way to see Santa at the department store, accompanied by Red Tool, her sidekick. Harley gleefully declares, I love department stores at Christmas. I love everything at Christmas. You're not behaving like a proper Jewish girl, Red Tool observes. I never behave like a proper Jewish girl. Harley counters. Here in an out 
Here, an outside character declares Harley's Jewishness rather than Harley being granted agency in regard to her identity and referencing it herself. In addition, he chides Harley for seemingly inappropriate behavior. Both these comics, alongside many others, have Harley defining her Jewish identity largely through her combativeness towards it. By contrast, DC Comics Bombshells, an alternate universe World War II comic, centralizes Kate and Harley's identities as queer Jewish women in reparative ways. In 2015, DC launched Margaret Bennett's DC Comics Bombshells. The series imagines a universe in which the US entered World War II early and none of the male superheroes of the DC Comics universe exist. Thus, it follows an entirely female-led cast of superheroes and supervillains turned anti-heroes battling Nazi Germany during World War II. Bennett envisions a world in which the U.S. did not remain isolationist for so long and actually became one of the first allies to join the war. This reimagining aligns with many of the political underpinnings of work from Jewish superhero comics creators such as Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster or Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, who Superman and Captain America were fighting Nazis and socking Hitler long before America entered into the war. In addition, Bennett explicitly depicts characters like Kate and Harley as Jewish, centering their Jewishness as personal motivation for their actions as superhero and anti-hero combating villainous Nazis. Such an acknowledgement serves not only as a reparative transformation to prior representations of Kate and Harley, but of the golden age superheroes altogether, when creators could depict heroes only metaphorically and subtextually as Jewish, which during the 1930s and 40s. In Bombshells number eight, Kate catches a Nazi informant in Gotham. In a silhouetted image, she hoists the informant into the air by his collar and demands to know what information be sold. he sold. When Kate realizes that the man is informing Nazis which ships the refugees his brother smuggle out of Germany will be on, he tries to defend himself. Please, the man you're looking for, he, he was just a Jew. So am I, she declares, an icy edge around her dialogue bubble indicating the coldness and ferocity with which she makes this statement. While in previous incarnations, Kate's Jewishness had been pre presented mostly as incidental, through this alternate universe, Bennett centralizes this aspect of her identity, making Kate's Jewishness a primary motivating factor behind her heroicism. In Bombshells, Kate defiantly declares herself as Jewish in a way neither she nor Harley had done in previous depictions, giving her character a newfound voice and pride for her Jewish identity. As with Kate's associating her Jewishness with her heroicism, Harley, rather than being reminded of her Jewishness when she misbehaves, openly declares her Jewish identity herself for the first time in Bombshells. In issue number 46, Harley infiltrates the Berlin underground and runs into Kate and a number of other heroines. Suspicious, Kate demands to know who she is. When Catwoman says she doubts that the Reich has taken to recruiting half-dressed Harlequins, Harley adds, nor pretty blonde Jewish girls with half a charm school education and a whole whopping medical degree all to themselves. Unlike previous comics when Harley's rebelliousness existed in contention with her Jewishness, here Harley mentions these aspects in the same breath, both components of herself representing targets for the Nazis' hatred. In addition, in this first meeting, Kate and Harley exchange flirtatious banter, with Kate making a quip about how she much prefers batter to catcher and Harley teasing her for the terrible joke. As a sharp contrast to Holiday Story, Bennett depicts Harley finding solidarity with another Jewish woman explicitly through their shared queerness. In Bombshells, Harley's inability to be a nice Jewish girl is not belittled, but valued and does not detract from her ability to help her people, as seen when she prepares Molotov cocktails with the people of the Berlin Underground for the battle the following day. When Harley observes Molotov cocktails from sacramental wine this is probably incredibly offensive isn't it another jewish woman assures her dr quinzel god will understand in the war effort harley's misbehavior doubles as resourcefulness to help other jewish people rather than a source of antagonism between herself and her identity
In Bombshells number 49, Kate has an encounter with a young Jewish girl, Miriam Batzel, that perfectly encapsulates the series' themes of Jewish women's solidarity and the potential to transform traditional female Jewish roles. When Kate admits to Mary that she is scared, Mary comforts her, telling her she should not be afraid because you're with us and we're with you. Our women have been in a lot worse before. Is that so, Kate asks? Yes, Mary says. The prayer says, may God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah are our mothers, but there are so many heroines to admire. She goes on to name Deborah, Judith, and her handmaiden, and even explains the origin of her own name, Miriam, Moses' sister, a deliberate alteration from mainstream comics where this same character is named Mary. You know so much, Kate observes with admiration. Mary says that the Reich wants her to be ashamed, but she is proud and draws strength from remembering her heritage and the courage of her people. Kate admits, where I'm from, I never, I know this is my blood, but I don't know the words. It's just a part of who I am. I don't know the prayers. I don't know the stories. I, acknowledging the difference between her experience as a member of the Jewish American diaspora and Mary's as a German Jew. Mary assures her, that's okay, I can tell you the stories. Maybe there will be stories about you one day. Or you, Kate says. This moment demonstrates the way Kate draws her strength from her identity as a Jewish woman, both through her utilization of Jewish kinship and her transformation of typical female Jewish roles. This inverts the traditional maternal expectations for Jewish women, which often take on the form in in fiction of teaching children and, you know, in a larger context about their own Jewish heritage. Rather than teaching Mary, Kate admits her own ignorance and encourages Mary to teach her their kinship formed on the knowledge the young Jewish girl shares with her. Furthermore, furthermore, Kate and Mary bond over stories of the trials and triumphs of Jewish women from their collective past. Kate's Batwoman creates community both through her pride and her heritage and the bond she forms with women in the contemporary, symbolizing hope as an unapologetically queer Jewish heroine. Margaret Bennett's DC Comics Bombshells further develops the representation of Kate and Harley as queer Jewish women, centralizing their Jewishness as key to their heroic identities. In doing so, Bennett rewrites the superhero genre to encompass narratives of queer Jewish women's solidarity, creating a new space for these multivalenced identities within mainstream comics. Thank you. All right. Ooh. Hey. I have it under control. I'm going to I'm just going to hold the mic cuz is this working? Okay. Um, Thank you so much to Rachel and Maggie for inviting me here today. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am, I named my presentation Beyond Words, Some Jewish Women's Comics and Cartoons of Grief and Loss. So um, as you'll see, I'm going to be showing slides of three different um, memoirists. So these are all cartoonists who who are drawing about their own lives, drawing and writing about their own lives. And they're all themed around grief and loss. So the first is um, Nancy K. Miller, who's a memoirist. And this is actually, um, they're cartoons that I wrote about for the collection that we're celebrating here today. And then the second cartoonist is Roz Chast. Some of you may know her from her New Yorker cartooning. Um, And I've included some images from her memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which is a collection of comics. And then the last one is a single um, cartoon by Leela Corman. And the reason I'm telling you this before I actually show you these images is for several reasons. So first, one of the things that you'll notice is that the first cartoonist, the content of the comics is not explicitly Jewish at all. And I think one of the interesting things to think about today is what makes a piece of literature Jewish. Um, This question, of course, the question of categories is just as um, difficult and problematic when we're thinking about what makes a text a comic. Um, And same with memoir. So um, I've had this long interest in these questions of categories that just aren't so obvious. And I hope we'll talk about it more 
during the Q&A. So we'll start with Nancy K. Miller's cartoons. The other thing I want you to really keep an eye on is with these three different women's works, just how differently they draw their bodies and their experiences. And um, I'm working right now on a book on grief and loss. So loss and grief, of course, could include feelings of loss if you're going through serious illness, chronic illness like cancer, so loss of self, but also the last two cartoonists, grief of the loss of a particular person. Okay, so we'll show the first slide. So this is from Nancy K. Miller's um, online cartoons. So Nancy K. Miller is a memoirist and a scholar. She was actually my dissertation advisor. Now she's my collaborator, and we actually have a book of essays uh, forthcoming called Feminist Reclaim Mentorship. That's just a little plug. Um, and around 2011, so she had begun to, um, she'd never drawn before, but I wrote my dissertation in comics, so she had developed an interest in cartooning. And then she got a cancer diagnosis, and she turned to drawing, and she writes this in this blog, um, and you can look on nancykmiller.com if you're interested in more. But she writes about this turn to drawing comics because she couldn't, she found she couldn't write. She couldn't, um, she didn't have the same kind of a attention that she had had before. And she rejected all efforts to write down her experiences, but somehow she was connected to drawing. And this is something actually that is a thread among a lot of um, cartoonists, memoirists, which is oftentimes in times of upheaval upheaval or illness, um, there's this turn to cartooning as a way of maybe putting pen to page. Sometimes there's a kind of um, emotional energy that goes into drawing that isn't necessarily available um, when you're writing prose. So her cartoons, I'll just go through them briefly, and the, the full piece is in the book itself. Um, but this is an interaction between her and her doctor, and so her doctor's giving her a diagnosis on top so there's a real resistance in her experience of going through cancer and and um dealing with doctors there's a real resistance to the language right the language is stale a lot of it doesn't make sense to her a lot of what she's being told um, makes her own body feel foreign to her and you can kind so here she responds to what the doctor is telling her by saying whoa right it's this visceral reaction and the doctor responds by saying i am not a horse and so she's taken this real moment of patient resistance in the office and turned it into a comic, she's turned the doctor into this uh, cut out of a horse. And you can see lots of ways in which the two of them have almost become different, spe well, they have become different species visually on the page, right? And so it's really emphasizing that break um, when you are experiencing something like chronic illness. And on her blog, Nancy Miller quotes Susan Sontag's very famous line about how when someone is sick, there's the there's the kingdom of the well, and then there's the kingdom of the sick, and some of us get to go pass from one to the other. Um, and Miller writes about how after her cancer diagnosis, she really felt as though she was split even within the world when she was quote unquote healthy. So there's a lot of um, creating binaries and breaking them down through the art. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to show a couple of images, and I write about this in the book, that really share her experience and the ways in which this um, experience of chronic illness, even after she was so-called cured um, or they didn't find any, any more cancer in her body, um, the ways in which it shaped or reshaped her experience of time. And so she had to continue getting scans to make sure that there was no more cancer. And here she includes an image of herself, um, a repeated image, to show the ways in which this illness experience had dramatically altered the way that she was experiencing day-to-day -day time. And there's lots of interesting things to say about this image, um, a new way of experiencing the calendar, a new way of experiencing her own body. Um, there's also a kind of comfort in the ritual of repetition and a horror, and I think you can see that. And my piece is called From Surreality to Surreality, and I think that really encapsulates all of her images in which she's trying to show how these everyday experiences feel surreal and things that were once intimate and familiar are suddenly completely unfamiliar. Um, and I, I love the slight, um, the hands up as 
a sign of both resignation, but I also think you can think of it as resistance. Um, next image. So this is, you might recognize the famous Frida Kahlo painting, um, the two Fridas, it's a self-portrait, and Miller superimposed an image of herself and a friend of hers who she happened to be um, getting um, infusions of chemo at the same time, and one day they went together to get them, and she writes about that experience. And one of the things, of course, to think about with illness, with grief in general, is the isolation of the experience, right? Nobody else can ever feel what it is you're going through. Um, but in a sense here, there is a common bond, but you also get this strong feeling of these two separate people. So the other thing I want you to think about as you're looking at the image is, what is the role, what's the purpose of creating images about these experiences um, that are very personal, very um, depersonalizing in some way, and what's your experience, what's your role as an audience member, as a reader, what is it that you're, what is it that you're getting out of these images, or what is it that's expected of you? Um, so next, okay, so this is a photograph from Roz Chast's brilliant memoir. If you haven't read it, I would strongly suggest that you read it. it. I think it's one of the best graphic memoirs ever written. And it's called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And it's the experience that Roz Chast, who's known as a New Yorker cartoonist, has of caring for her parents when, as she describes it, they hit not just old age, but very, very old age. So they're in their 90s and their health very quickly declines. There's a beautiful image in the book where she depicts them just sliding down a, a, a very steep ski slope um, to signal the decline, the very sudden decline in their health in very late age. Now, what's um, really interesting about Chas's book is she includes photographs, single cartoons that you'll recognize from her New Yorker style, and also comics, in other words, sequential comics on the page. She also has pages of handwritten prose, and I could talk about her book for a very long time. I have an article coming out, if anyone's interested, just about the book itself. Um, and what she's really what really interests me about the, the book in relation to today's topic is that she says early in the book that her parents never wanted to talk about two things, death and Jewishness. Those were two topics that were never allowed to be discussed. Now, if you know um, Roz Chast's New Yorker work, she doesn't explicitly talk about being Jewish in her cartoons, and yet there's a kind of insider language of neuroses, of being a New Yorker. Eventually, she moves out to Connecticut, but there is a kind of insiderism that we could also talk about, you know, what is it? Is it signaling Jewishness? Is it signaling something beyond Jewishness? In the book itself, she only mentions Jewishness in these tiny little um, two main um, or several little uh, moments in the book. And what I did when I, I tried to piece together a reading of the book and think about what makes the book Jewish was I tried to really put together these different moments of not just her grieving and caring for her parents, which is sort of the obvious thread of the book, but actually grief that her own parents experienced. So if you turn to the next slide, and I don't want to take too much time, so this is early in the book where she writes about that's a child that her mother lost before Roz Chast was born. A stillbirth, uh, the child lived for one day. And the the um, story that her mother doesn't like to talk about, so she learned about it from her aunt, is that her mother was reaching to change a light bulb. She was standing on a step stool and she fell off. Now, what's really interesting, and this is what I love about comics, is sometimes the connections that you make, you make between images, whether those are images written as words or literal images on the page. So if you turn to the next page, and this is from much later in the book, you can see page 53 now, this is a moment that Roz Chast has drawn, and it's in response to this poem her mom has written. So basically, she describes her mom's decline, which eventually ends in her mother's death, as starting with this fall from a ladder. So it's another ladder. Um, and the mother goes on a ladder in order to get something that 
basically um, comes out of a conversation she has with Chas on the phone where her mother says, oh, I have to find something and, and share it with you. So there's this connection um, between these two narratives that you can think about, the loss of that first child and the mother's eventual fall from the ladder, which leads to her decline and death. In a way, the way that I read the connection between these moments is, in a sense, it's the daughter sort of taking some responsibility, justified or not, for what eventually happens to her mom, because it's her phone call to her mom that leads to this experience. So there's these different linking moments that you can connect throughout the text. And if you turn to the the last image from Chas' book. So the book ends, the initial book ends where she has her, she cremates her parents, so not Jewish in a traditional sense, and she doesn't know what to do with um, these cremains. And eventually, this becomes a later New Yorker cartoon, a fan writes her and says, I found your sister from that first page. I found where she's buried. And so Chas goes on a trip. This becomes the epilogue to the book. She goes to the cemetery where her sister's buried and she buries her parents there. Now cemeteries often come up for texts that are not obviously Jewish, for Jewish writers writing about their life. It's oftentimes when in the death of a parent or someone close to them that suddenly Jewish identity surfaces. And in this scene, she shows a picture also of the Jewish cemetery and of where her grandparents are buried with their Hebrew names and the Jewish stars. So there are Jewish connections here. Okay. Next slide. So I'm going to end with this slide, and I'm sort of skipping around here, but this is another um, a short comic by Leela Corman called Yard Sight. Yard Sight is the Jewish prayer for the dead to commemorate people who have died. And um, Corman here is writing about the death of her very young uh, daughter, three year old daughter. And she's connecting that death with her grandfather, um, whose whole family was killed in the Holocaust. And she's connecting those narratives. So she's connecting the individual experience of grief with this communal experience. And what I want you to focus on is that bubble um, where it says the hole does not close, there is no refuge. And think about how the two of them, that's her and her grandfather, who's died already by the time she's writing this comic. So in a sense, she's connecting the two of them through their grief, but they're also, you can see from their body language, they're also still solitary, right? They're, everyone always experiences grief individually. And then you can think of us as sort of onlookers and think about what is our role here. We're obviously, we're not allowed into that space. There's a real clear barrier between us and the space in which they're being held. And yet, we can see in, we're given access to it. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Um, thank you so much. Oh, good. Um, so since these were all very different presentations and I, you you all might have gotten a better idea of what the whole book is like. Maybe you can give us some idea of the rest of the book or what themes, um, you know, you feel like you have in common with other contributions in it. it and it, it's a forthcoming book. Is that right? It's yeah. about to be published. It's coming out next month. We have it okay. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting question, mm -hmm. right? that are ranging from very obviously Jewish texts to ones that are happen to be by Jewish authors, mm -hmm. like the Nancy K. Miller comic, mm -hmm. but don't have explicitly Jewish content. So mm -hmm. I think that in itself is very interesting. And we do have lots of good questions for each other about the mix of Okay. So, I mean, I think one of the editors is... Uh, is uh, Sarah Lightman, who herself is a scholar, but also a cartoonist, and so I, and she's also done a lot of previous work on Jewish women's comics, um, and so I think she really wanted to sort of get a breadth of representation. I think one of the things that you're also seeing among our, uh, our, our contributions is that breadth, right? And we have like, you know, mainstream comics represented, 
uh, which is really interesting too, because like mainstream comics, there's a you know a history of a lot of um, uh, Jewish artists and writers, right, involved. But then how it gets treated in the comics themselves and how they're pandering to sort of Gentile readers is is really interesting. So um, really appreciated that. But I think like the book is sort of trying to present sort of like a wide array of possibilities and artists and, and sort of serve as sort of like a like a a, a platform for launching. Um, I, I think you guys had some points you wanted to bring up between yourself, so why don't we go into that? <laughs> Whoever wants to start. Um, so maybe I can start by asking mm -hmm. a question, because we all had questions for each other, and hopefully our audience has questions too. Um, so one of the questions that I had, and I think both of you could maybe speak to this, is this question of like the benefits and the limitations of genre, metaphoricity, right? So, you know, what is the difference between Sharon Rudall writing very particularly about her family experience with pogroms and anti-Semitism versus writing and her or someone else? And, and we could apply this also, I think, like, outside of Jewish texts, mm -hmm. what does it mean to write about, um, you know, even like anthropomorphism, right? Like what does it mean to turn humans into animals and, and turn these like real life genocidal experiences into metaphors that then readers are meant to take from, but also what are the limitations there? Um, so the the comic about her grandmother actually, if I'm remembering correctly, is originally published in Women Comic Women's Comics Number no. Five, which is an international women's issue where they have like artists from France and other places, and everyone's sort of representing someone from history. And so I think it's really interesting that she chooses someone from her family and talks about family history. And because it's also such a condensed format, I think she's like, you have to be really focused, right? Um, but then when she gets Adventures of Crystal Knight and she's able to have like 36 pages, still pretty condensed, right? Uh, I think it's interesting to think about sort of the question that you brought us to, like when is sort of Jewish identity going to be brought in and how and when is it sort of going to recede but still be present there and sort of the decisions that the characters are making, um, you know, in, in the narrative. Um, and, you know, the main character is in some ways brought up by this Jewish woman, but we're not sure if she herself is Jewish, but she's sort of aligned in this way with Jewishness and becomes a sort of Jewish hero, um, folk hero um, at the end. Um, and so that's something, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking about too. Um, that's really sort of like at length versus at depth, but also like why, and I'm still working this out too, because it's sort of, it's a weird science fiction, like why does it need that frame? Like what would it mean to like take that frame out? Um, but what does it mean to also put it in? Because also her like, she's, it's a space for her to sort of think about the pain of Jewish identity and it's always, all of her science fictions are dystopic. There's no hope in any of them, so, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna have a piggyback question for you, Margaret, off of that, but thinking through kind of the sense of like Jewish identity and like the use of genre bending or science fiction, that's very much present in like Jewish superhero comics as well, right? Like this idea of kind of like the super heroic figure. And there's a lot of conversation, particularly in mainstream comics about like early comics as a like a Jewish boys fantasy like Superman as a Jewish fantasy um, which is sort of flipping the script right on like white supremacist narratives of like what the, the Superman is because it's by kind of these these Jewish writers um, who are embedding that sort of narrative subtextually but like we've discussed it can't be explicit kind of in the 1930s and 40s this is always sort of subtextual um, that's why I mentioned like Captain America like Socking Hitler is sort of, again, a very bombastic kind of example of this, but a narrative that you get that clearly is meant to be, you know, anti sort of white supremacist Nazism during this period when that that's sort of a controversial take in America. Um, and then Bennett is building on that and applying that to kind of like Jewish women specifically. She's trying to kind of format this so it's not just exclusively like a male lens, which is sort of it's now the Jewish kind of little girl's fantasy. Um, but I think there's there's limitations to that. And there's a conversation to be had about like, 
why does it have to be this super heroic kind of narrative, right? Like, why do you have to be kind of like the perfect pulverizing sort of hero who can and can fight Hitler with your fist, right? Like, why does that need to be the narrative? Um, that's something that, again, it is a limitation, I would say, sort of of the genre and of a mainstream comics. Um, but again, like I said, to piggyback for a question for Margaret, I think you pointed to something really interesting with Rudolph, this sense of like dystopia and that her science fiction comics are dystopic. Whereas we get like these realistic comics, right. About sort of her grandmother and past Jewish experience that tend to be more optimistic. Do you think this is just me asking kind of your thoughts. Do you think like the science fiction metaphor is necessary for her to be ambivalent and she feels more pressure in kind of a realistic narrative about Jewish Jewishness to be optimistic or to be kind of like tell the story right of triumph versus like when it's metaphorical maybe or has that kind of like distance she can be dystopic and ambivalent and explore some of the darker elements that was something I was curious about yeah I mean I think in short yeah I mean I think it does sort of allow her to sort of uh sort of think about sort of the fullness of experience and identity and allow her to sort of get to different things and and use sort of the history in a different way um but also like just like some very dark humor like in the space of a page you know this the the character who's sort of like the character who raises crystal knight but sort of the sort of sort of becomes a side character like she's visiting her grandmother her grandmother is telling her this like terrible like this terrible history has these really large speech bubbles right like that you can't miss while her parents are like right in the background plotting to send the grandmother away to her death basically because they are now gaining on that day gaining control of the company mm-hmm. right which her grandmother built after surviving um this experience and so it's like she it's almost like the grandmother wants her to remember because she knows she can't count on the parents to pass along this history and so there's this sort of um you know this this skipping of the generation that sort of is, is necessary and sort of this sharing um and remembering right and then she and she remembers but she remembers and sort of naming this child um crystal knight um you know and, and it's and then it's sort of like i feel like the metaphor is like solid but it also sort of unravels right um in a way um, and I, I feel like maybe some stronger editorship maybe would have like had some sort of tighter meaning, but it sort of all sort of comes back together at the end. So it's, it's a really interesting um, story. And one thing I was thinking about, too, that we've been talking a lot about, if I can sort of um, pose this question, is like teaching these things. Like um, also because I know sometimes, um, you know, people are like, oh, I'm teaching literature, but then how do I teach comics alongside literature? And I think, you know, your work um Tanir does a really good job of sort of blending literature and comics together and also thinking about sort of like literary antecedents of Jewish women's literature and how it connects to sort of comics and so I was interested to sort of hear like how do these sort of texts show up in your teaching um what sort of ideas do you have for teaching them those sorts of questions um and I just want to go back for one second because I think this question of Sharon Rudolph and this more optimistic autobiographical works. What strikes me is, you know, if you are a descendant of Holocaust or genocide survivor, how can you write that story without some hint of optimism just in the sense of here I am, I'm still alive? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it maybe it's different for immediate survivors, like thinking about Primo Levi, (laughs) not particularly Mm -hmm. optimistic. But if you are not just that you survive, you're sort of marking that that you survived and that you're here to tell the story and write about it, there is a kind of optimism just in the gesture of doing that that I think is kind of unavoidable. But it's a really interesting question. Um, So for teaching, I love teaching comics alongside prose. And the book that I'm writing is actually a mix of the two. And for me, it's really productive to think about moments, for example, in prose literature that are really highly imagistic. So just with my book on grief, like um, reading it with a sort of comics mind, reading books of prose, what I started to find were how many moments of that this experience after you lose someone are signaled by visuals. So I'll give an example. There's a moment in almost every memoir that I read about losing a spouse or losing a parent where the person um, 
goes back to the place where that person lived or the office they inhabited, the space they inhabited, and looks at their objects. There's often scenes of looking at the body after it's died and noticing and describing those differences. So for me, reading comics um, oftentimes alongside prose helps me uh, really like boost those moments, those visual moments in prose. I, I guess I would err on the side of, for me, the comics are the most productive, but that's my spin because that's where my research has been for so long. In terms of teaching them, I think it can be really helpful to teach two books with a similar subject, but in these different mediums. It's also a great, great way to think and talk to students about form to really think about, you know, what makes something a comic, what are what is different about conveying a scene, about losing someone, or Leela Corman has this beautiful comic about the experience of PTSD and how it feels in her body. It's really brilliant. So she has this image, for example, where there's like a almost a shadowy self hiding behind herself when she's in public, so it's like she's split. And so in some ways, like those visuals help describe physical feelings or emotional experiences that are very hard to put into words. It's going into that comparison can be kind of like a circuitous game. Um, but I think it could be really helpful to, to then turn to like Simone de Beauvoir's memoir about losing her mother and think about, you know, moments that sort of match but don't match when she's in the room with her mother and looking away from her mother's naked body as she's dying and compare that with Roz Chast drawing her mother's body after she dies. So for me, those are really productive moments, but I have to get past a lot of um, bias from colleagues <laughs> to teach these texts. Sometimes students, oftentimes I have students who are very well versed in comics, but don't necessarily think that they should be learning it in the classroom. And I think we get past that very quickly when we start thinking and talking about comics as just another way of telling stories with its own particular history, its own conventions, but still a, a different way of telling stories. Um, thank you for letting us into your comic scholars conversation. We might also um, open it up. Uh, some of our audience probably is familiar with some of the comics that you've mentioned and might have questions about what you've talked about. Uh, so I'll probably try to repeat your question so everyone can hear, but do you want to start us out? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, what's interesting with the example that I gave today of Bombshells as a comic, which was a digital comic, it came out in two thousand two thousand fifteen. It's the first instance of Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, who is primarily kind of her love interest, and in, again prior in Fanon and hinted in the animated series where they debut, it's very subtextual there, um, where they kiss on panel. So that happens in kind of 2015 with Bombshells. There's hints prior to that that they are like a non-monogamous couple. We see them in bed together um, a lot of times. Some of this is very kind of like male gaze fan servicey to sort of hint at kind of like sapphic relationships in a way that's meant to be you know appealing to sort of a male gaze um but that's the first instance we get of them kissing on panel and they have sort of a developed relationship in that comic and then now they very much do have again a canonical relationship you see develop in mainstream comics it went from that alternate universe sort of setting to the mainstream comics in a few years after that and now we also have have like the Harley Quinn kind of television show where they're a couple in that. Um, Kate is established when she was introduced 
in 2006, 2005, or 2006, reintroduced as the Batwoman figure. Um, she was specifically introduced as a lesbian character. Um, so her queerness is always sort of inherent in that. And we get Harley's Jewishness hinted. I didn't talk about the earlier moments from Batman the Animated Series, which has a lot to do with the performer, the actress who plays Harley Quinn in that show, is a Jewish woman and sort of like, you know, having these subtextual moments of like hinted Jewishness, but it's primarily defined in kind of those holiday comics in like the 1990s and then becomes, again, Bombshells is an example where I would say it becomes explicit. Um, and then the Harley Quinn show has Harley being explicitly Jewish, but there's a lot of controversy around Jewishness in that text because the creators of that cartoon, a lot of the people in the room were Jewish, but there's a lot of kind of anti-Semitic tropes that are played with, um, which in that instance, the writers say is meant to be reparative and that this is meant to be kind of comical and reclaiming um, some of those narratives. And then there's, there's pushback against that because of kind of the mainstream audience. So there's always this, this kind of awkward tension, I feel like, in mainstream comics of like, when you're representing these things for a wider audience, right, a straight audience or, yeah, a Gentile audience, how do you represent it correctly to that audience and still represent it authentically for people who come kind of from that background? Um, so in the latter part of the 2000, to 2010s, I would say, is when we get that much more explicitly. Um, and it's still very tense kind of in terms of representation. Thank you. Um, other thoughts or questions? Yeah. So how are these identities portrayed? I mean, sometimes one of the things that you see that can be useful, if it's not overdone too much, is a, you know, like a, a pairing of image, but also text. Like, so in the beginning of Adventures of Crystal Knight, the grandmother character is ex giving a lot of history very quickly. And um, also... I think it's important that the the comic happens on the inside cover and so it's like framing the story it's sort of in some ways separate from the story but it's part of the story um and so you can have um moments of exposition right um but then they're sort of heightened also because there's these images around them that sort of show you this character show you what's happening um i think also in comics um i really love rebecca wanza's new book the content of our caricature. So she's talking about um, she's talking about the black experience um, in comics and how sometimes for them they're using um, in order to sort of uh, do reparative work or sort of um, you know deal with like white supremacy. They are um, sometimes using these caricatures that are have been racist um, and doing sort of really important complex work with them. And so I think that's also one of the histories of comics that's a bit complicated, especially also when we come to Jewish uh, heritage, is that there are a lot of um, racist caricatures and sort of the early history of comics. And so then there's, uh, do you use that? Do you depart from that? How do you draw upon that or how do you push that away? Um, I know, you know, like Art Spiegelman and uh, his sort of comic, um, thinking about 9-11 sort of like is sort of engages a sort of the early history of comics and sort of is like bringing these characters that are often seen as racist like into his sort of thinking so you know i think it's complicated given that also how caricature has been used to shorthand but shorthand in ways that are um can be very offensive and and even in mouse spiegelman talks about this um in terms of you know how to represent his characters and using mice rather than using people and Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky territory, but I'll just echo this 
importance of context when you're representing any group. Um, and also, you know, just thinking of like Jews on television, uh, the marvelous Mrs. Meisel, if anyone knows that show, the main character, character who's a Jewish comedian woman is played by a non-Jewish actress. And, you know, there's been a lot of questions and con someone recently emailed me, what do you think about this? And I think, you know, part of it has to do with who's behind the scenes, who's creating the character, what are those conversations happening, what's going into the character um, and then part of it is what is the audience learning about that character from their end? And is it just built on stereotype? Um, what are sort of like the nuanced conversations that are being put together both on and off screen? So in or outside of the comics. Um, a lot of Jewish women in from the underground um, use stereotypes. So in my book, I write about like the Jewish nose mm -hmm. as a stereotype that a lot of these women signal in their own work, and so they're incorporating those anti-Semitic stereotypes, but because they're Jewish women and, and they're explicitly talking about how these are stereotypes and playing with them and bringing a lot of humor into mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. I think um, there's something very powerful about that work, about just sort of taking back the caricature and spinning it, and also showing how those images impact us like everyone, everyone has stereotypical images of some aspect of their person that they've seen out in the world that they've, they have to battle internally with. So putting that on the page can be really compelling. There's been um, books about Jews in comics for at least 20 years, probably a lot more. And I guess male was usually implied in many of those titles. Why a book about Jewish women in comics now? What do you think occasioned this? I mean, not to do the Hillary shoot card, but I mean, I think so in 2010, there was a book called Graphic Women by Hillary Chute, which sort of was like, let's pay attention to the women. Um, and it sort of turned the tide and opened up a lot of conversations. But then we still had uh, a few years ago, Angloem, the French Comics Festival said, we have no women nominees because women haven't contributed enough to the history of the comics medium to be honored. So like this, this uh, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, BS, like, continues. So I try to figure out not to curse. But um, I think so, it's, I think it's important to, uh, to also just recognize that there have been so many Jewish women creators, right? And, um, you know, so like to, to further specify, or we're also in this moment of like thinking about uh, like, intersectional representation, representation. So how do these two sort of identities um, like connect, but also like, so then you are like talking about like three identities and like, so then like how does sort of queerness to come be, uh, be a part of it, right? And we're talking about both like metaphorical, like I think there's a larger conversation, especially in mainstream comics that maybe you can speak to in terms of like this book's positioning where like uh, mainstream comics readers now want not just metaphorically representative characters, but they also want um, superheroes that are that look like them more explicitly yeah yeah I would absolutely agree with that that it's obviously an academic discourse but it's just a, a, a mainstream or like a, a critical discourse writ large right at this point the idea of that readers do have this demand for representation um, and the idea that they will have avatars in kind of like the superhero genre that we want to be the heroes that have been subtextually referenced or have been kind of like implicit that implicitly Harley Quinn was, you know, queer early in the, the Batman animated series in the 1990s. We want that to be explicit um, or that we want to, again, recognize yeah, Jewishness as central kind of to the comic book superhero as like a narrative that it's always been there implicitly or subtextually that's something we want to tease out explicitly so i think there's that as as a discourse that people are very much joining and an expectation to fulfill that representation um and i think too more broadly if we're talking about like jewish women specifically even just the idea of women in comics right is a conversation that we've been having in kind of like the late sort of the 2010s into the 2020s um and things like 
Gamergate, right? And these sort of like intensely sexist kind of narratives about like women and geek culture. So like a combating of that is very much happening. So I think there's a need to like fill that niche and acknowledge the fact that no, we shouldn't just say that like Jewish comics representation is male by default and just assume that it's male by default. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that's very much happening. I'll just add, I don't know if it has any, I don't think it has to do with, it's the same timeline as the book because the book has been a long time coming. Yeah. But Mouse is being banned increasingly. There's been, a, I guess, yeah, the Southern Poverty Law Center calls it a resurgence. So it's a resurgence of anti-Semitism um, alongside racism and white supremacy f over the past whatever five, six years. So I think, especially because Mouse had such an outsized influence on a lot of cartoonists, including many, many women cartoonists, many Jewish women cartoonists who either directly had family who had been in the Holocaust or had somehow connected directly to that narrative. But also, you know, lots of cartoonists in general were influenced by that book just because it won the Pulitzer and, you know, it made a big splash. So I think that that book being in the mainstream conversation now because of its banning in so many um, places right now it doesn't hurt the desire to t start talking more about Jewishness in comics in general. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Yes. a very good question. Um, I haven't seen the whole volume, so I don't know. Um, I think that, yeah, bodies and borders, so they, there must be. I, I was going to say with the volume, I do think because Sarah Lightman is based in the UK, I don't know where the other editors are based. I, yeah, I do think it has more of a global reach in terms of the artists that they were able to recruit and the pieces in the book. Um, so I imagine that there's very likely more conversations um, in that vein. But yeah, I can't speak to specifics. Yeah, no, um, I can't speak to specifics either. Again, I mentioned briefly in, in my kind of piece about like the contrast right between like Mary as kind of a, a German Jewish girl and then like Kate as an American Jewish woman and sort of their conversation as you know different sort of members of the diaspora but I didn't I didn't focus on that very explicitly um to the question of whether comics it lends itself to diaspora I think that's an interesting kind of conversation piece because it's so heavily visual like if we think about comics as being heavily visual there might be something to tease out in terms of like communication of ideas that isn't exclusive to a certain language right or like the ways in which we could get it in in translation that might be something perhaps worth kind of thinking through yeah or even representations of like borders and national boundaries um sarah glidden's work how to understand israel in 60 days or less is that what it's a um i actually have a chapter on it and i so i write a little bit about this in my book but I think in terms of just thinking about maps and mapping, there are certainly Jewish authors who play with that question. And if you think about it, just like comics can help you rethink your relationship to the calendar or to time, they can also help um, reconvey what it means to be of a certain place or to feel like you are or are not part of a certain place. And then just to get to that very kind of like metaphorical kind of sense of form, if you think about like borders in the panel, that's that's something you could think through too, right? Like conversations of transversing the border and transversing the, the panel or like the communication between images and what's happening in the panel. Again, that that's very kind of academic, right? But but I think there's something to to be teased out there, definitely. And, la and language and translation, right? Mm -hmm. And if we think about in this country, the history of comics and immigration, how oftentimes um, 
there were lots of comics that immigrant readers would be attracted to because they didn't have to know the language as well in order to read them. So there are threads that we're all sort of nodding to. Great. Um, any Anything else from our audience? Uh, if not, then I, I think we'll have some refreshment together afterwards. Thank you so much, all three of you. <laughs>